You're listening to Dairy Voice by Dairy Business News, a podcast exclusively for the dairy industry. One of our sponsors of the Dairy Voice podcast is National DHIA. NDHIA ensures information accuracy and represents their members' interests. They are the direct voice for the dairy information industry. To find out more, go to dhia.org. If you raise calves, you know you can't prevent stress, but you can give your calves the boost they need to rise above challenging conditions. Nurture Boost is a uniquely formulated feed additive that supports calf lung health and enhances overall immunity to elevate your calves' ability to withstand stress. Boost your calves for better performance at boostyourcalves.com. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in your day. Welcome to the Dairy Voice podcast by Dairy Business News. I'm your host, Connie Cooper with Seal Pro Silage Barrier Films by Connor AgriScience. Thanks for joining us today. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. Listen in to our wide variety of topics and personalities on past podcasts too. So I was listening to Mel Robbins' podcast last night about the importance of breathing, walking, and sleeping. And if you haven't heard it, I highly recommend that you go to Mel Robbins and listen to that podcast. I haven't finished it yet, but she usually has really good practical information. Specifically about breathing, she had a researcher on from Ireland who has studied how we breathe and how crucial it is to breathe correctly, leading to a better immune system, more energy, and better sleep, which benefits everyone around us. Today on Dairy Voice, my guest is Dr. Julia Hammond, who is the Senior Technical Specialist for Dairy, Young Animal Tr Nutrition in North America for Cargill Animal Nutrition. And our subject is calf lung health. Welcome, Julia, to the Dairy Voice podcast. Hi, Connie. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Well, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Julia. Uh, my background is in veterinary, veterinary medicine. I have been with Cargill, well, previously with Diamond V for 11 years and in this new position for over a year uh, for the young animal nutrition and, and the dairy side for North America. How did it start? It's very interesting. Um, my background is in veterinary medicine, but I'm a city girl. Um, oh. Originally, if you can tell, my accent is not from Iowa. Um, I'm originally from the Dominican Republic, and I grew up between Santo Domingo, which is the capital. My family migrated to the United States, specifically New York City, uh, in the late 60s. So my summers, part of month, I spent there between Santo Domingo and, and New York City. So I'm a city girl. I knew that I want to work with large animals, specifically with dairy cattle. And I came and did a training. There's a training program that was offered by the Holstein Association, which I didn't apply through it. I applied directly to a farm in Wisconsin. Mm. That was many, many years ago. They were doing some work, uh, initial work with embryos transfer. So I had an interest in that. And I also wanted to know a lot about farming because I did not have any background in farming. I came there for three months, I stayed seven. And I started working with Dr. Dayoman. That's where my passion for calf started. Mm. The farm had a, a really expensive stock we em calf em from embryos to bride from embryos, and there were not a lot of management uh, in place. And that was the word for the first person, you know, the latest trainees, you're going to feed the calf, but there were not a lot of program and a lot of protocols in place. So I started working with Dr. Oman, establishing in establishing protocols, learning about calf management, and they offered me a job to come back. I took the job and I started working calf. So I fed calf. I learned how to milk an entire stall barn in Wisconsin with 50 cows. Oh, wow. And from there, it, it just grew. So I started doing the job from ground zero. Mm -hmm. Did some rotation with the University of Wisconsin. Did some work with the University 
uh, always constant extension as well. Mm -hmm. And my passion just continue growing and growing. I have the opportunity to work for the service agency as well and the mail program. From there, the ball started rolling. I got a, 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 pos a position with Diamond B where I was a liaison between marketing, research, new product development, and the group team. Because of my first language is Spanish, I had the opportunity to, as well uh, going in the field and work with the technical team. So I kind of miss that part of being in the field with the customers, with the animal. I am keeping a lot of stuff because <laughs> my trajectory is kind of long, but I was uh, the young stock manager dealing with eternity, transition cow and heifer up to six months as well. And I, then I decided to go for Diamond B to do uh, the technical support in the field. I was doing a lot of milk quality, a lot of transition cows, animal health and calf. And last year, it was the opportunity with Cargill, uh, just working with calf. So I jumped to it. Oh, and I was good. lucky enough that I got it. Oh, so good. that's that is more than 20 years of In my a career. Nutshell. In yeah. a nutshell, correct. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I'm skipping, you know, through it. What a story. So I'm curious. How did you first learn about this whole thing if you grew up in the city? Deary. Because I I went to the vet school and some of my teen and uh, my colleagues from the school, they did the training okay. and they knew that, yeah, they knew that, okay, Julia, you want to work. Originally, I want to work with horses. Uh -huh. That was like, okay, I want to work with horses. But when I was in clinic and horses, I saw how dangerous they are. They're beautiful. But I said, I don't know. I'm not really sure yeah. that I want to work with horses. So I'm more I'm more inclined to work with the cattle in a specific cab. That was yeah. always my passion. And so some of my colleagues say, well, this I did this program. It's, it's very good because you know anything about the management. You know anything about the farm. And starting in a small farm, it gave me the opportunity to see like what you do in the farm, what needs right. to be done. Because one thing is what you learn in the school and what you read in the research, but when it's need to be applied to the farm, it's a lot of difficult. And there's a lot of factors sometimes. They know everything that's in the book can be applied at the farm level. You always have to work with the farm and what is available and try to control the controllables. So that's, yes. that's my thing, like trying yes. to control the controllable. So that mm -hmm. was the way that I got to Wisconsin. At that time, I think I was the first Hispanic in that community. Mm -hmm. There that the mm -hmm. migration of oh, a lot of Hispanic workers mm -hmm. started to happen, I believe, around 2006, 2005. And that's when I started to do a lot of work with the extension, with the Wisconsin station, especially with Tina Coleman. She was the agent uh, at the Cheboygan County. So we're starting to do, a, we develop a, one of the modules, a training okay. module for Hispanic employees, especially sure. specific in CAF. Uh, so I got very involved in that. That was kind of my passion because I rather to be treating animals. I rather been preventing the diseases, teaching right. people how to do, because most of the issues on, in, in, in the health of the cattle, especially in bovine, it has to be with management. The bigger pathogen in a farm, it works into leg. It works into legs. So if you teach people a well, a good management is very well-being of the animal is very impo important sure. for the health. And you can see the correlation, like stress and immunity, goes hand to hand. Get your Steel Pro Silage Barrier Film today. Protect the seed, fertilizer, labor, and expensive inputs that you've invested in. Choose best-in-class Seal Pro now in three different versions. Traditional two-roll application, our new co-rolled application, and super simple and wildly successful one-layer film, Seal Pro One. It's easy to buy, easy to use. Contract your covering, we'll work with them. Learn more at sealprosilage.com. That's S-E-A-L-P-R-O silage.com. Family owned and operated for over 25 years. 559-779-5961. That's 559-779-5961. Well, let's talk about immunity. Can you give me an overview of the calf's immune system? The calf's immune system, let's talk in general. 
first we need to divide the immune system in three main components. So there are three main components in the immune system. Let's talk about the barrier. Uh, the barrier is the first line of defense in the immune system. And 90% of the pathogen can be stopped by that barrier. And let's think about that barrier, like defense that we pull to contain the animals or the fence that we use around our house. Uh -huh. And the skin is one of the bigger organs in the immune system. And the idea is to keep all those pathogens that can, or any intruder that can cause a, a reaction in the immune system. So let's think about the barrier. Sometimes the barrier works and doesn't let anything happen, but then you have to have a second layer of protection. And that second layer of protection, uh, we call the part of the immune system or the immune response. I like to think about this uh, this part of the immune system, like the uh, your alarm system, your alarm system, or your dog. Sometimes that take care of the intruder, and we're going to think about their dogs, those micro macrophages like neutrophils and certain cycadins. They will engulf the, the the phagocytosis of the the intruder. It will take care and go, but sometimes you know they need help. Dog will not take care of that uh, intruder. That dog will send the alarm to you or to the police to recruit a more a specific defender. And that's the acquired part of the immune system. Uh, okay. The acquired part is more specific. So one thing that we know is the in to the belief the innate will respond to anything. It has no memory. We know of related research that we can train that part of the innate, uh, the immune system they need. It takes time. It has memory. It needs to build those antibodies, those specific antibodies to defend the, the animal from the pathogen. That part of the immune system, sadly, in the calf, the calf formed with the barrier and the innate. There's data that there's in, innate response in fetus. The adaptive part of the immune system is not developed time, it will take up to 60 months. So the calf will depend those first seven days, first week of life, it will depend on the passive transfer of antibodies from the colostrum intake, for the intake of colostrum, for the maternal colostrum. Even though if we do a really good job uh, providing high quality colostrum free of the bacteria, because something that's very important to know is not only the IgG and colostrum, it's there are a lot of other, a lot of other uh, components like cycadin, spectine, uh, or uh, hormone growth, everything the calf needs to develop not only their immune system and establish a microbiota, and you will, and we will can talk later the relation between the microbiota and the immune and the immune response, establish a microbiota. There's also going to help develop organs. It's the level of bacteria that's there's in the colostrum. If the colostrum is, is contaminated, it's high in bacteria, the calf will not have the capability. The capability of that calf absorbing the IgG is going to be drunk by it. Mm -hmm. So even though if we do a good job with the colostrum and the calf is getting that colostrum, there will be a window between day 14 to 21 where the maternal antibodies, they're going to come down and the calf is going to start building their own. And that's the acquire uh, mm -hmm. response on the immune system. They start kicking in there. There's no sufficient between those times. The adaptive response of the calf is not as strong. So the calf will depend mostly on the innate response and the maternal antibodies to defend, to protect itself. We need to do as much as we can to mitigate the pathogen load that the calf is going to be exposed through his life and the stressors. So there's harm that we put uh, the calf through hundreds of stressors. Birth is the bigger one. Then is the horning. Then is weather changing. You know, it's mm -hmm. a cold, it's a hot, cold stress, uh, heat stress. It's ventilation. Um, it's the, the energy that we're providing to the feed. Uh, are we changing the diet? Are we mixing the milk? If we were providing milk replacer, are we mixing the milk replacer consistent? Are we winning then? Are we transporting then? Are we moving the calf from one place to another? Are they, do they have to travel many hours? They're just going down the, the road or, or 100 meters away from where they were. So all those are a stressor for the calf. They, they will have an impact in the immune system. We talk about the connection between lung health and the overall 
immune system. So tell me about that lung health and, and how those two are closely related. Cattle is more susceptible to lung issues than any other species. As if you compare a horse with a cow of the same way, the lung capacity of that cow will be three times lower than the horse. Really? Yes. Huh. And they, yes. And they require, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can get any stuff here. And the requirements for that lung in the cattle it will be 25 times higher than the horse. Put the bovine, the cow, and more prone to get lung issues. That's one. Other thing is, uh, I remember that I mentioned to you the the microbiota. It has a really good relation with the immunity. How stable and how diverse and how strong that microbiota is, because that's going to be part of the barrier. You know, it will correlate with the response of the immune system. The respiratory tract of the cattle it has an abundance and a diversity of microbions. Mm-hmm. Through the track, and that mm-hmm. will be changing starting from the nasopharynx, where it's more abundant, going down to the trachea to the lungs. The thing is, we believe that most of the pathogens, most of the bacteria that cause issues in the lung, they're living commensal. And if he, I show you a graphic of the microbiota, there's a bunch of mycoplasma, mynhemia that we can find in the nasopharynx of the animal. But there's if there any changes in the mucus and the epithelium cells, and they're starting to produce more mucus because pu- mucus is part of the barrier to eliminate uh, intruders, that bacteria is going to travel down the trachea to the lungs where it's going to become pathogenic. And the way the lung diseases work is that usually doesn't come by itself. It's, mm. it's multifactorial. It can cause outbreaks and endemic. And outbreak is the most commonly caused by virus. And it can happen certain time of the year. You know, it will happen from animals up to 50 months of age. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be seasonal. It's going to be something that happens seasonal and it's going right. to be triggered by ventilation, by uh, crowdiness, all this stuff. The common virus take advantage. The virus is going to change some of the morphology of the epithelium and through the tract, standing the nasopharyngeal going down to the lung. So those bacteria, because they were irritated by the tonsil, for example, the steria, the tonsil is going to irritate it, they're going to damage the tissue. Most of these bacteria love the tissue. And the way that the immune system works, especially in the lung, when we activate the innate response, the first line of defense, the first cells that they're going to come to the, are neutrophils. Neutrophils are the first one they're going to show. Neutrophils will cause a lot of toxins when phagocytide. They're going to phagocytide the engulf the bacteria of the, of the virus. It's going to die and it's going to expel a lot of toxins, a lot of ROAs, a lot of accidents, or a lot of free radicals. Those free radicals are going to cause damage around the, around the area. Mm-hmm. Then that's when the bacteria is going to come secondarily and take advantage of that. For example, mycoplasma, one of the bacteria, more common bacteria besides myhemia, they love that tissue. Apply. And even my hemia, if you would put my hemia uh, in a healthy loan, health will not be seeing issues. We will see it mostly after the loan is being impacted by a virus. The virus first, the bacteria comes yeah. and feeds on that. And yeah. that usually happens between two, seven days. We see the round. This is the thing, like Animals get diarrhea. After seven, those animals that get diarrhea, they're going to be more susceptible to respiratory issue. And we know it's because we're impacting the gastrointestinal tract. Gastrointestinal tract microflora has the dead correlation with this immune response because 70% of the immune cells are in the gulp. So calf gets sick with diarrhea. Then it comes the respiratory cycle because sadly, there's a lot of uncontrollables. And sometimes we are not, we are getting busy. We're not paying attention to all those uncontrollable. And we are not minimizing the chances for the animals to get a secondary infection. So calf get the virus, going to take to ten, seven to 10 days and 
and then the bacteria. With the data from Dr. Uh, from the University of Wisconsin, with long ultrasound, you can uh, ultrasound a calf and find damage in the lawn, and the animal not showing any signs of pneumonia after seven days. That, that's in a completely healthy looking calf. You can have a completely healthy looking calf and you go ultrasound the calf and you will find a score two or three, three, and uh, you're going to find a long lesion in the calf and the calf no show any signs, maybe up to seven day after. Well, we can talk about signs of, of poor lung health, but now you've just told me that you took, sometimes you can't even see the signs. Let's talk about, so what would you look for without the benefit of an ultrasound? Having in consideration the bovine, if uh, they will be hiding any sign of weakness from the predators. And us, we are predators, even though we're taking care of them, they see mm -hmm. us as a stranger. Having that in consideration, when you work with animals, it's really good to have, well, good observation. Right. You need to be attend of how the animal is behaving. And sometimes you can see the fit intake going low, but the attitude of the animal is very important. Droopy, no, uh, droopy ears, sag, extending neck, those are high respiration as well. But some, sometimes those signs are very low. They share on the nostril. I like to follow Dr. Chila make your uh, scorecard from the University of Wisconsin too, you know, where you can give a score for every condition, signs of right. fever, there's fever or not, even though many times an animal can have a, a respiratory event and no show any signs of fever. The opposite, the temperature can be below normal. So how the temperature regulates hypothermia or fever you know there's something is not it's not right with the animal. So the breathing, uh, if you have an stethoscope, you can school that is uh, you can school the 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 lung and see if you can hear or not hear something in the in the lung. The hair, the attitude, fit intake, droopy ears, extending neck. No, uh, this chart this chart on the nose that will be a very typical sign. High breathing. Do not confuse also uh, high rate, rate breathing. We heat a stress. Sometimes it just mm. make sure that the temperature, the uh, the temperature in the in the environment is not too hot, causing heat a stress in the animal. Knowing all that and knowing what you had said before about the ultrasound of healthy appearing calves makes prevention more and more important because mm -hmm. I'm guessing that if you have a calf that's showing symptoms, they've been long ago under stress. So but I will go back to trying to identify what type of issues you're having. You're having an endemic issue that you can see it from calf um, two or three days old, and you see it all year round. It has nothing to do with seasonal or it's an outbreak. If it's something, if it's an outbreak, you is more. You need to be more tend to check your management. Mm -hmm. What happened in your barn? Do you have way too many animals for the facility that you have? How is your ventilation? People like to check ammonia levels, and I will have it. I will remind people that by the time we can smell ammonia, which is at 25 ppm, uh, it's a little bit too late. Human mm -hmm. uh, nose can detect ammonia at 25 ppm, and we can see damage in the calf lawn at 10 ppm already. So just have those things in consideration. Uh, that being said, so we can watch the ammonia levels with some kind of a, a, a measurement system. Keep your bedding dry, have good ventilation in your barn, so you can always bring uh, clean air. Avoid draft and humidity. Calf lies dry, well ventilated areas. And we cannot forget the most important part is energy. Nutrition is more, very important because the immune system requires a lot of energy to function. And the animal will utilize the energy as a seed feed. They will prioritize how it's going to use the energy. If the animal is sick and is exposed to more a stressor, it will have to be requiring that energy to maintain themselves alive. So the more sick, the sickly is the calf, the more energy is required. If we want animals to be healthy, we want animals to grow, we have to have animals healthy.
diarrhea, poor ventilation, all those things, uh, any uh, respiratory event, all those things can increase the energy uh, requirement of that calf up to 150%. And I would think that uh, along with that clean environment, you're talking about bottles, bottles, clean, clean bottles, bottles and, and clean hands on the people who are feeding the calves. Exactly, because we also have to think about our security, and there's a lot of a lot of pathogens that can be so noticed, can be transmitted from the animal to the people, and the people to the animal, to the right. person, to the animal as well. I always like to tell uh, my customers, if something is not clean for you to eat, it's not clean for the calf. We are never going to put a baby in the outdoor, in the wet bed. So what are we going to do with the calf? Humans can, humans' ma can transmit passive, they can uh, transmit those antibodies in uterus. The cow can't. Mm -hmm. Calf have to wait until we feed them colostrum to mm -hmm. get those, those part of the immune system that's going to be protecting them right. until they can develop their own adaptive part of the immune system. Julia, what is your opinion of calf hutches versus calf barns versus other ways of, of housing cattle? Connie, I'm the believer that you can make anything work if, when every time you follow cons uh, consistency with the calf. Because mm -hmm. I cannot go to a farm and tell you need to be, build a new barn. If we, we control the controllables, we can make anything work. Now, there are some stuff that work better for some farmers and for other ones. I fed calf in Wisconsin. I know it's not easy to feed calf in hutches in Wisconsin where it's so cold. So sometimes we also need to think about the person that's feeding the calf because if they're happy, they're going to do their job better. And when we work with calf, we need to be consistent and we need to have an employee that is happy and they know the why of the job that they're doing, providing them product calls and the education about the why behind. So if you tell me what will be your idea bar, I will say, this is my preference. This is what I would like to feed. I will probably have pair housing and it will be probably a, a barn. Natural ventilation, but I probably will, I probably will be supplying the uh, positive pressure tubes as well. That in, in this barn, I will like to do all in, all out, and also have the, the capability that I can transfer those uh, those hutches, small hutches, uh, to bigger. And I would like to have at least 35 square feet per calf in those okay. hutches. Mm -hmm. And the, I will have the capability to pair the calf at different ages and then make bigger groups slowly. And then I can get, like, as I mentioned before, all in, all out. But we can make work hushes. We can make work a lot of other stuff if we, we control the controllables. And the controllables are cleanliness, consistency, good col colostrum. Colostrum management is the key to any successful uh, 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 rating, uh, calf raising operation. So. Colostrum should be always the number one thing that any farm should be uh, paying attention. This is the, the liquid goal. So cleanliness, energy, how much we are feeding the calf and the process of weaning of the calf too. So let's talk about weaning. And that's a, that's a huge stressor. So mm -hmm. what is your recommendation as to the process of, of weaning? It depends how much milk are you providing. Okay. If you're providing around two gallons of milk, two pounds of powder. So I will recommend you to do a longer, a longer period of weaning. Take more time to give the opportunity for that calf to eat a starter. We always talk about that you have to remove the, the milk when or start the weaning process when the calf is consuming three pounds of more of grain. Now, some later research, they're talking about five pounds of more for three consec consecutive days. And the DCHA has great uh, guidelines. You know, if you go and look at the gold standards from the DCHA, they have great guidelines to follow. Mm -hmm. Your um, process of weaning the calf, it has to be linked for the amount of milk that you're feeding that calf. Okay, if you're providing a lot of milk at the beginning of your calf, then you need to take a little bit longer to wean this calf. You cannot be thinking about weaning calf at 45 days if you're providing three gallons of milk. 
when do you suggest to start feeding calf starter mix? From day one. If you're in the farm program, they will require you to have fresh water and fresh grain in front of the calf at by day three. That's ah. by law. If you are, if you want to be in the farm program, that's going to be the requirement. You know, feed is expensive. So I will recommend you if you're going to start feeding grain from day one or day three, do not offer much to the calf mm-hmm. because you don't want to waste that. Right. The calf don't start consuming grain until probably three, two or three weeks of age. And I say consuming an amount that is noticeable. Mm-hmm. Because we can see calf needling in a straw, we can see calf needling in Betty. So we want those calves to start needling in the grain. We want to stimulate the calf, the starter intake, because from that is going to depend the rumen development. And we need that rumen to be, to be developed. By the time we win, then if the rumen is not developed, even though it continue up to three months, the development, but at least if we had those ruminal papillas develop, the absorption of nutrients and the transition from wheat milk to grain is going to be easier. Yeah, for the first couple of weeks, they're, they don't really care about grain because mm-hmm. that's not their nature. They are practically monogastric. You know, they have a that's my right. reason. They're going to be digesting the milk. But we want that rumen to develop. And for that, calf needs to have water in front of them and they have to have fresh grain. If we skip that, we are losing a lot of potential of gain in those calf. And we are making that transition from a wet calf to a wing calf harder for those calf. And that's when we can see a slump. That's one of the reasons I mentioned if you're feeding a lot of milk, you have to give it a period, a longer period of transition. If they're getting all the energy and they're getting full with milk, they're not really eating enough, enough grain. If they're not eating enough grain, there's the human the development is delayed. Okay. So we've been talking about uh, all this calf care, but the big elephant in the room is transport transportation and taking these calves from one place to another. And we have a lot of that going on where calves, like you said, are just going down the road to a calf ranch or to a different facility, or they're being trucked a long way. Tell me about that. Tell me, tell me what, what about that? uh, What your opinion of that is and, and how we can make that transition easier for calves. Well, I was trying to see the, the data, you know, that was put out there in, 20, in 2014. So the numbers might be changing, it might be higher. 62% of large farms, because the larger the farm, the farther the calf go, are sending, are sending pre-wing calf to another facility to be mm-hmm. raised. And 69 of the half are coming back pregnant. 69% of those are coming back to the farm pregnant. Yeah. The thing is here in the United States, you can put an animal by law, you can put an animal for 28 hours in a truck. In Europe, it's eight hours. Mm-hmm. And you can go to up to nine hours if you have a special uh, updated uh, transportation vehicle. The data out there say the longer the calf, if it's a calf younger than uh, seven days, the longer is the is the hours, the more stress in that animal, and they're more making them more susceptible to diseases. Sure. So if you're going to transport your cattle, uh, we will recommend you that you have the adequate. Uh, a space for the animal that you have bedding that you have to have in consideration the temperature you need to make sure it's going to be too cold or it's going to be too hot remember there's babies there some of these calves are less than 24 hours in Europe you cannot transport an animal younger than a then how old eight days Oh really? And if, yeah, and if you are doing that, if they're younger than nine hours, you the nine uh, nine days, you have to have more stuff in places. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we need to think that we are transporting babies. Younger calves are more susceptible. You know, we're going back to the thermal this the thermal neutral zone in the calf. A calf that's less than twenty one days is going to be more stressed. We call a temperature of fifties but it's going to be in a heat of stress and humidity of 68. So we need to have all the things in consideration. Maybe we'll need to be offering an electrolyte before we mount in, feed then, because sometimes those calves 
they don't get fed for 28 hours or 36. We have we have people sending calf as long as 36 hours. How many colostrum feedings do you suggest before they are moved? I'd like to have, if you're giving a gallon of colostrum and you have the opportunity of feed the calf before, uh, again, it's 12 hours after mm -hmm. you fed the first, I will suggest another feeding, either mm -hmm. colostrum of milk, because especially if that calf is going to be in transportation for 24 hours. Sadly, we don't have uh, transportation vehicles now that are equipped. Equ they had equipment to feed the calf during the transportation. And mm -hmm. I know there were some data uh, that came from Canada, I believe, they were they did some stop and they were providing water and electrolyte in the calf mm -hmm. to helping the calf with that. There's a lot of people that have protocol established, you know, already when they receive the animal to feed them an electrolyte and provide them their feed, their next feeding with milk, either sure. whole milk or or a milk replacer, commercial milk replacer. Mm -hmm. But if you had the opportunity to do a second feeding, either colostrum or milk replacer, do it. You are going to be transporting animals for more than 24 hours. And what about when they get to their destination? I will suggest to provide some electrolyte and feed them as, as soon as possible as well. Some people use some feed additives. There, there's a lot of feed additives in the market that you can use as well to help prime the immune system and, and make those animals tolerate the stress of transportation as mm -hmm. well, uh, better as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, gosh, we've covered a lot of ground on on calves, and I really I've learned a lot about caring for calves from birth until uh, they're weaned. And we've talked about the different feeds that we need to feed them, um, how their immune system works. We've talked about transporting here in the, in the last few minutes and about how prevention is very important for maintaining these calves and the environment is very important. It's all important. And like you said, if we think about them as babies and we take such good care of our human babies that we can put those kinds of ideas towards taking care of bovine babies and get a greater success. I think it's important too that you mentioned about uh, having happy employees and, and setting them up for success by having protocols that are understood and understood why we're doing these kind of protocols. I see that so often on dairies here in California, that if employees understand the why of things, they can do a much better job. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Julia? Most of the issue or the majority of issues in dairy are multifactorial and that we need to control the controllables. Yes. And when I talk about control the controllables, mostly how we feed our calf, how we keep the facility clean, we have the right tool for our employees, um, and uh, how we manage the maternity. If you have the opportunity to manage the calf from birth, please put a lot of attention to the area. Talk to your milker, to the person that's harvesting that colostrum. Educate them of the job that they're doing and the importance of the job their job that they're doing and the cleanliness in that area. You're working with babies that are more delicate than human babies, and they will depend on that colostrum and a low bacteria count and that colostrum to those uh, proteins, those IgG, they're going to protect them from diseases during the first couple of weeks of life until they can develop their adaptive immune response. If our listeners want to know more, is there a website that they can go to, Julia? They can go to putyourhairsfirst.com. You will get information about our Cargill team and you can contact us and they will redirect any questions that you had for me. I don't know if my name is still is, is there or not, or if it's just a general uh, website, but if you have any questions, that will be the, the easiest way to reach to me. Or their cargo representative, I would assume. Any other cargo representative as well in your area too. Sure. Um, I'm located in Cedar Rapids, but my, my position is, is North America. But we have a very knowledgeable calf specialty, specialist in, in, the, in every region here in the United States. They are equipped with knowledge and the attitude and the passion to work with calf as well. That website again was put your herd first com no spaces or anything will you be at world dairy expo julia yes i will be there 
Ron and I will be there with our Seal Pro booth as well. We're in the tent area. I think you're probably in the exhibit building, but we'll, I, I'd love to come and meet you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the good. invite today. And this was very exciting for me today. Oh, thank well, thank you. We've been talking to Dr. Julia Reyes Hammond, Senior Technical Specialist for Dairy for Young Animal Nutrition for Cargill Animal Nutrition. I've learned a lot today about calf immunity and lung health. I think you probably have too. And like we said at the beginning, breathing is important and breathing our best makes for better health and calves are no different. I'm Connie Cooper with Seal Pro Silage Barrier Film by Connor AgriScience. And you have been listening to the Dairy Voice podcast by Dairy Business News. Please subscribe, like, and share this podcast. And we appreciate the care and perseverance of all dairy farmers. And especially as we head into harvest, stay hydrated, stay rested, and stay well-fed. Thank you for listening. And we'll talk again very soon.